uh, in this roundtable discussion um, focused on women in chemistry, we have six uh, very prestigious speakers that I will shortly introduce. So we have uh, Sharon Bryant. Uh, Sharon Bryant is CEO uh, at Intelligent, a company that develops molecular design softwares and provide consulting services to life science industries worldwide. And she is also guest professor at University of Vienna, uh, teaching, in the mass, uh, teaching in the master in drug discovery and uh, pharmacy program. So welcome, Sharon. Then we have also Professor Rui Moreira. Uh, he obtained his PhD at University of Lisbon and Open University. And after the postdoctoral stay in the UK, uh, Professor Rui started his career in Lisbon and was promoted to Professor of Medicinal Chemistry in 2006, becoming head of the department and director of the Research Institute for Medicines. Uh, Professor Hui uh, has uh, wide research interests and uh, the fields of the medicinal chemistry and physical organic chemistry covering the development of anti-infectious, anti-cancer agents and also product chemistry uh, and structure reactivity metabolism relationship, the, uh, the design of covalent inhibitors and uh, the design of chemical probes for activity and photo affinity based protein profiling. So let's welcome the EFMC president elected. So welcome, Professor Hood. Uh, we uh, have also in this round table, uh, Dr. Maldu Heiter. Uh, she is the director of new ingredient discovery at the corporate R&D division of uh, Firmenc uh, in Geneva. Uh, Maud received her PhD from the University of Oxford after the doctoral, uh, postdoctoral work with uh, Princeton University. Maud joined Merck in the USA as a medicinal chemistry. And uh, in 2011, uh, she moved into the her current, her current position. Welcome, Dr. Maud. So, we have also in this round table, Professor Himon Hay. Uh, she uh, achieves her PhD degree in organic chemistry uh, at Harvard University in the United States and her postdoc training in life science at MIT and her independent the laboratory that began in the mid-2012, uh, uh, now at EPFL, strives to solve major bio biomedical problems underlying genome regulations and stress response. She has been globally recognized by numerous accolades from ACS awards and also the 2020 F EFMC Young Med Medicinal Chemistry in Academica, Academia Award. So, welcome. We have also uh, Professor Maria Laura Bolognesi and uh, Professor Krista Muller that I have already introduced. So, welcome everybody. So, we uh, will uh, we'll start uh, with uh, one question, but we are also uh, looking forward to have questions from uh, the YouTube. So, please. Uh, I ask the audience to uh, share some questions or topics for discussion with us. So first, um, maybe uh, Professor uh, Hui, the man should be the first in this case. Uh, professor, uh, how, how do you explain that such few females are in high position in MedChem and ChemBio? Hello, everyone. So let's uh, first thanks the invitation to be present at this uh, round table and uh, for this uh, session of um, organized by the Young Scientist Network. It has been, uh, I mean, the talks have been really great. 
and of course it's going to be a challenge for me to be in this round table as I, in fact i was chosen the, as the first the first uh, the first speaker so the question is about the uh, translation bit from uh, uh, for women from uh, initial positions to high positions in any institution i suppose academia and and companies well, it's it's about I would say is it different? Is there is a difference in geographies? So that's I think we need to take that in account. It is not the same in everywhere in Europe, for example. But there is an issue, and and the issue I think is related to in part to the mindset. I mean, uh, the mindset is is up to now was not about recognizing the issue and. Um, which means that uh, when decisions are taken, perhaps in some cases it's, it's difficult to make the, the, the right selection between to promoting, for example, a woman to top top uh, positions. Um, but I think this is this is um, this is changing, and particularly in the last five years across Europe. I can talk about academia and uh, as uh, in terms of. Uh, chemistry, medicinal chemistry in, in academia, um, I can say at least in Portugal, I would say that the um, percentage of uh, women that are occupying now more, the, the top positions is, is, is increasing. And of course, I mean, the, the actions that we could take to, to speed up this, uh, this trans transition from the initial positions in careers to top positions, I mean, it's 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 very complicated. Uh, I think it's it's all about mentoring. Uh, mentoring at the initial parts, I think, is is um, is essential, and to uh, empower uh, women with leadership, I think that's that's fundamental for success. And um, I would say for 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 you at this time. Thank you, Professor. I don't know if someone would uh, like to comment on this. I guess I can jump in. <laughs> this is Sharon. Hello, everyone. And I would also like to thank the previous speakers for these amazing uh, presentations. And I think in the presentation of Maria Laura, you have really uh, indicated already um, a lot of research in terms of references and where we can find out. There's been a lot of research on this. You know, what what is the cause? I mean, the title of one of your articles is where did they go? So, you know, if you have a certain percentage of chemistry degrees and you're not making it into um, advance, advancing your career, then the question is why? And I do um, also uh, agree with uh, Rui about the mentoring, but I think there is a way we can also expand mentoring, mentoring to include a kind of um, mentoring, just not of students and, and um, postdocs, et cetera, but mentoring also of colleagues and people in leadership positions, and also thinking about um, uh, this idea that's also been presented in the literature in these studies about um, uh, gender, negative gender stereotypes, um, gender biases related to um, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe ideas about um, women's leadership skills or women's uh, level of uh, science um, capability. So that those do exist and, um, and somehow some mentoring in those areas can really help us um, move past that um, I also think on the other side, um, there has to be something coming from the organizational side of things. So it's not just women taking control and saying, I'm going to get mentoring. I want to have better uh, skills um, to have leadership positions, but it needs to come from an organization um, culture and philosophy to help advance um, uh, women in succession roles. So sometimes there's succession roles and and uh, women may not be considered for those. And women may also leave um, the field of medicinal chemistry if they feel there's a ceiling on how far they can advance in the field. Can they get um, funding? Uh, can they be promoted in the area uh, where they're doing research? And of course, we have also um, maybe Krista, you know, mentioned, I also had the same experience, Krista, um, when I came through NIH, I had very few female mentors 
Um, my mentors were male and they were very supportive of my career, so I can relate to that. But, um, but there's also this aspect that there's a bit of isolation. If you're in a, a, a you know, surrounded with a lot of me, uh, male peer colleagues, you may also want to have some female colleagues. So these are areas where we can really help in um, women's advocacy to um, uh, create these networks that Maria Lauer was talking about, where women can um, uh, form support and networking and 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 peer to peer contact um, to help us discuss and talk about the kind of issues that we face and how we can also mentor each other. Um, so those are just a few thoughts. Sorry if I went too long there <laughs> from my side. If I I can um, jump in here because um, I wanted to, and I saw the camera went to Maria, but I wanted to point out one of the m organizations that Maria mentioned earlier, which was the Empowering Women in, uh, in Organic Chemistry that was created by Rebecca and uh, Nikki Goodwin in the US. Uh, I think in addition to being mentors, I think having a support network of peers is extremely important. And part of the reason also um, why I was invited to, to be present today is that we recently founded the Swiss Women in Organic uh, Chemistry Group. So for whoever is in the audience, um, you can find us very easily on LinkedIn. And uh, the main uh, idea we had was in addition to providing mentors, we also wanted to create a sport um, network because something that um, is well, in particular here in Switzerland, what we see is that when there's a few female speakers at the conference or few female prize awardees, well, it's sometimes not because they didn't, there's a lack of trying, but there's actually a lack of nominations. And I think that for everyone, uh, we don't need to always mentor, but I think just support. And if you have a colleague, a peer that you think does a great job, well, nominate them for a prize or suggest them to, uh, for uh, a presentation, because I think that will bring us a long way. Yes, please. I don't know if someone... yeah, I will uh, briefly comment. Uh, I feel that, you know, I was um, trained as a classical organic chemist and then I switched to more biological field for my postdoc and I feel that you know maybe part of the reason traditionally why we have you know fewer uh, women and uh, trainees and all the way up to the higher level in medchem or chembio is because chemistry is generically organic chemistry especially is not really favored uh, by young women for you know whatever reasons that may be compared to biology because you know during my uh, undergraduate and PhD training I, I had like you know maybe one or two um, uh, female group members out of 30 uh, people, less than 10%. And then when I go to biological, you know, groups, that is completely different. So I, I feel that, you know, to me, uh, uh, I'm quite positive because uh, MedCam and CamBio now is quite expanding the boundaries to be more cross-cutting. So as we bring in more, you know, interfacial ideas, expertise from biology, genetics, I feel that there will be more interest from young women that may not, you know, traditionally favor organic chemistry as a major field of training. So I think it is also, you know, science uh, or field specific um, issue in terms of, you know, young women um, being in the, or fewer uh, uh, in, the, in, in chemistry as a field. If I say not something, yeah. Uh, all the different opinions, of course, are uh, very shareable, but I just would like to point out that it's very important uh, to start from the young generation. And uh, as uh, Rui was mentioning, if we should change the mindset, we should start from the young generation. So I very much, I, I'm, say, I'm repeating uh, many times that uh, what you are doing, Philippa, you, all the others, the Young Scientist Network is truly spectacular because if we have to change the mindset, you know, it's easier to start from young people because they are more open to change and in, the par in parallel to work with more senior um, scientists and medicinal chemists trying maybe to have concrete action 
that could be uh, like uh, considering target in the conferences, uh, as uh, we were mentioning before. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Maud was saying, okay, yes, not a bit. We don't have speakers because there are no nominations. This is true. Sometimes it's not, but sometimes it's true because we are scientists, so we rely on a meritocracy. So this is the first point. We don't want to be there because we are women. We want to be there because we are the best women that are the same with no difference with our male colleagues. So uh, that's why if we, want, if we want to change, it's better to educate. And in parallel, if we want to change the situation, in a, a reasonable uh, time, then we should uh, to aim for target. Um, target that are reachable, uh, such those uh, for the conferences uh, speakers or uh, something like uh, uh, when you, we make interview at the academia, at least uh, to interview a certain percentage of uh, applicants and so on. So to me, yeah, I'm just repeating what you have already said, but we should work on two parallel uh, uh, paths. Education, which is very important, but even target if we want to change, uh, yes, quite soon uh, the current situation. Uh, yes, we have uh, one question from the, the audience that uh, is about the topic that uh, Professor Maria Lauro just raised. Um, and Vanessa is asking, uh, do you think that imposing a percentage of uh, women and men uh, in some work uh, offers could improve the situation? I don't know if Professor Krista Muller uh, can comment on this. Well, this is a very long standing discussion. And I actually believe that that you have to have some positive pressure. <laughs> I call it positive pressure, top down. And I think it's necessary, otherwise uh, nothing will change. I observed it um, here at the university. Um, if you ask them to hire women, nothing will happen or little will happen. Uh, but some positive pressure, some incentive, um, incentives, I would call it, or just, uh, well, the le less funding. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, it happens that, um, that there is a list with only women for a professorship. You have to start at the young position, at the starting position. You cannot just uh, find somebody for a very high position already because it's too early maybe. But I think there must be some pressure. And what I want to say uh, to the young people, to the young um, colleagues, um, the situation is now really good because there is pressure everywhere. Uh, and also awareness. Uh, this is very high right now. And uh, I think the, the young women have to be more courageous. They have to be more self-confident. I see young men, young women, young men, they are mostly, in many cases, they are very self-confident. They think we will do it. And also it's hard, you know? And you have you have to be resilient. You have to be stress resistant. There will be a lot of lot of problems and uh, disappointments. Uh, you don't get the funding or something like that. You just have to continue. You know, don't stop. Uh, this is just uh, it's a long way, and <laughs> it's also a lot of fun. It's a good job. It's, it's I enjoy it. So research, if you like it, it's fantastic. It's also, there are a lot of stones and you have to just to climb over them. <laughs> and uh, so be more self-confident, try it, you can do it. And the situation has never been better than today. It's my message. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have uh, um, other question from the audience. So Oscar uh, is asking, how is the balance in the early bachelor classes? Uh, because if we don't reach the desired balance at the early stage, how could we achieve this balance in the late stage careers? 
I think that we also comment on this, but I don't know if someone would uh, add something to this topic. Uh, I can just uh, speak for Germany. In Germany, we have until PhD, we have about 50% uh, 50, 50, 50 male, 50% female, sometimes even a bit more female because um, medicinal chemistry is located in pharmacy and we have 80%, 85% female students. And then uh, not as many men do a PhD, but we have 50-50 and then it stops. Then you have to drop, drop out after PhD, and that's the big problem. And it's a, it's a the problem of a whole society. It's a society problem, not a medicinal chemistry or chemistry problem. It's a society problem, um, and we have to change our society. I can also comment on on this. So, I, I truly believe that the issue is not at the bachelor level, because I, that first because it's not a thing that that we can control. In fact. But I think there is any problem because probably there is already 50% in an average uh, between uh, female and men uh, across the, the STEM courses. And, and the problem is in a way related to the previous question is how we can uh, in a way uh, facilitate the transition between early careers and later, uh, later stage careers. And, and that, that is crucial. The question of having imposing percentages is, is always is a very hot topic uh, at, in different areas. Then, then that could be a possibility, but we can always have a positive pressure, as uh, Chris was mentioning. I think that that is the, the people that is really uh, taking decisions need to, to make uh, a change in the mindset and turn into trying to be more positive and support the transition. By, uh, from the early career stages to the later uh, stages in the in the career, either in companies or in in academia, and of course, I mean, I, I would like just to talk as uh, as part of the FMC. I think the other the other important issue is uh, that societies uh, where societies can have a role is of course facilitate this transition, giving more visibility to uh, uh, women and. Um, as you, I mean, Maria Laura has just mentioned some numbers about uh, women in the board of EFMC, uh, uh, women speakers at the EFMC events, and this, I mean, this is always uh, uh, a glass that is half empty and half uh, full. I think the right move uh, is again to be positive, and in a way to, let's say. Uh, try to have a, a, a true balance or equality in the decision-making process, like uh, boards, uh, scientific commissions, whatever chairs of the of the meetings. In that way, we we could facilitate and give visibility to women. That that's the first stage. And there, from there, I think the careers will also benefit from this because uh, as they uh, women can present more uh, and more their science in uh, high quality forums uh, that, that will, of course, uh, also um, in a way be positive to the career. And, and there the societies have a, a really important role, I think. Okay, um, I have another question. Um, so I, I, I will ask this one. Uh, so the question is, what are the special needs uh, of uh, women in terms of working environment? Uh, there is any issue. We know that uh, the maternity can, uh, can also affect these numbers. So can you uh, comment on this? I might take this one because I, given our work in industry, um, I think there's a quite a bit of actions we can take. And for me, I would say one of the first ones is uh, the moment uh, you discover a woman discovers she's pregnant and in particular if she's working in a chemical laboratory, we can't always guarantee that she's not exposed uh, to chemicals. And, and I remember just from my earlier days when I started my career in MATCAM, I was extremely surprised 
surprised to see pregnant women who couldn't close their lab coat still working in the lab. And that was something for myself, an action point I did uh, in my place of work currently is that when I uh, are confronted with a situation where someone is pregnant, is working with chemicals where I can't guarantee their safety, I put them on another project and make sure that that project gets visibility and gets recognition so that they're not just put aside. And I think that's a, uh, so that it becomes for them a career move. So if they're pregnant, they are working in the lab until then, well, will they get a great rotation in a non-lab based role and make it into, turn it into uh, an opportunity. The second one is maternity leave. I can speak for the Swiss. Uh, what we have here as a great argument is that we have men leave on mil military leave. And so my argument is always if someone leaves on maternity leave and my kids in the background, um, I always say, but I've got men leaving on military leave and that evens out the discussion points. Okay, I don't know if someone uh, would like to comment on this also. We, even in academia, at least in Italy, we are moving forward in that direction. And uh, now for the advancement, career advancement, uh, the maternity leave is considered, if you have a gap in your career, this is considered and it's not a kind of penalty. And so I believe that Yes, we are doing something even at the, at the university. I'm sure even in other countries, so this is something which is not negatively impacting the career progression. And I think it's also for conference organizers uh, an important point. If you uh, want to promote uh, young female speakers that maybe just have young kids with them, that they should make sure there is a nanny service available, um, that and and that there's somehow guidelines on you know if you come to a conference, use this platform to find a nanny because I think well from personal experience that was one of my biggest issues that I faced, and I didn't find any help which where I used my support system to get advice, but I think that would be something to put into place as well. Okay. Um, so we have uh, one more topic to discuss. Um, it's um, more practical and is how can we motivate younger females to pursue in this career? Uh, I don't know if someone wants to share um, some uh, important uh, tips that use during uh, their careers. I don't know if someone wants to comment on this. Maybe. Maybe I'll mention uh, briefly. Um, I think it's important uh, to make sure that these uh, prospective young trainees and students, you know, um, thinking about choosing which field and including MedCamp, uh, they can uh, be assured that, uh, you know, they will be given absolutely equal opportunity, regardless of, you know, gender, gender, um, uh, etc. And uh, I think that has to start from really um, early, you know, early stage uh, from recruiting of uh, young students if you're a lab leader. You know, and of course, you have to be fair all the way to peer reviewing, grant reviewing, you know, award selection committee, so on and uh, so on and so forth. But I would also say, you know, from my experience and from what I have observed, you know, uh, because uh, this affirmative uh, uh, action and uh, kind of, you know, trying to make up these, uh, uh, you know, currently still imbalance uh, scenario, um, we do have to keep in mind that, you know, many of the young uh, deserving, uh, you know, pioneering scientists just because of their gender, many times they are being, you know, related directly and indirectly that they got something, some accomplishment because of their gender. I think there's now kind of a negative perception coming up in, in the field and actually it is equally demoting to, you know, sort of for, you know, pioneering scientists, young women trying hard and training and she definitely deserves to get something, uh, but, you know, because there's this, you know, thing that we, we know that it has to be balanced in any way, um, so you're out selecting, et cetera, et cetera. There may be some cases, but, you know, largely speaking, it is a, a, a fair process, and I think that's something that I'd like to 
mentioned that, you know, or we, we just have to be, uh, you know, kind of a mindset that some of the uh, panelists uh, have been um, sort of, uh, you know, voicing that as we try to catch up these, you know, uh, balances, we also have to be sure that we do it in a way that doesn't kind of, you know, um, make a disservice to these uh, really deserving uh, women um, scientists at all levels. And, uh, you know, of course, we don't want to mention that, well, you know, because this field is, uh, the, has fewer women, so, you know, join the field and you'll get higher, quicker, promoted, quicker, you know what I mean, because there's benefits for, because you're being an, as part of the minority, because actually for someone who really wanted to try hard and achieve things and they are actually indeed highly capable, that's actually quite demotivating to be reflected um, the kind of, you know, um, scenario and uh, I think I, I, I know myself and many people who have gone through this kind of, you know, comment directly or indirectly. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, may I jump in? I have some sound issues, so I hope um, you can you can hear me. Um, I wanted to just um, throw out some encouragement to say, um, you know, innovation is driven by diversity, and uh, we need that diversity, um, uh, a, a diversity representing a perspective. Um, and not a token, as um, was mentioned by Maria Laura at the at the end, right? It's not checking, ticking a box and saying we have 50-50, but a voice, representing a voice. So if you are not present um, at a conference or if you have an opportunity to speak, you need to speak. Um, uh, you need to um, get involved um, and whether that's a networking. So that voice is what creates diversity and what leads us to new insights. Um, so if you think about, um, uh, you know, early experiments using only male species of rats and, and, and later now thinking, okay, we do have to have a gender exclusive um, studies, uh, inclusive in studies. Um, these are examples, maybe uh, by having a diverse group of people present, um, it brings new insights together. So I want to say uh, as a message, you know, don't be afraid, kind of drawing on the thing for uh, the, the comments of Krista Muller, don't have that confidence. Um, uh, speak when you have an opportunity to speak, present, take those opportunities, nominate yourself to present at a conference. If you don't have, um, you know, in your country, um, a, a, a platform um, for peer um, a collaboration, then form a group like the, the Swiss uh, Women in Science group or et cetera, so that you can um, build a platform and present and know each other and begin to build networks and have that voice. Okay, thank you. We are finishing this roundtable, uh, <laughs> but Professor uh, Christian Mull, you, you can uh, maybe uh, give uh, the last comment and then the, the other panelists can also uh, leave uh, a take home message to, to the whole audience. I just want, wanted to answer to Yimon. Uh, don't don't be worried that you will be preferred only because you are a woman. It's just the opposite. It will take a long time, long, long time until <laughs> that happens. I don't see it. And um, I have many examples uh, uh, where it was the opposite, that men were preferred because they were men. Okay? So <laughs> don't worry about that and don't think about even think about it. Um, so what I want to say is, um, I mean, women and men are diverse, but uh, they are both great medicinal chemists, both genders, and they both can contribute something meaningful. And if you want to do it, if this is what you're burning for, do it, try to do it and um, tr uh, try to get help uh, from, from more advanced people who can who can give you advice. That's very important, I think, um, to to get get some counseling and to get get some uh, somebody to help you. You don't have to do it alone. Thank you. Uh, now, 
Professor Yiman, can you uh, leave a final message? Yeah, I think, you know, um, uh, I guess relating to, you know, my own experience, I would say that, you know, um, suddenly uh, being a, a young uh, scientist when I was an undergraduate student at Oxford, you know, uh, the lecturers are mainly male professors. So suddenly I feel that, you know, uh, being role modeled by, you know, really successful um, uh, professors who, you know, are the same kind of um, context, gender, background, I think you just could not help but kind of get inspired by them, uh, at least uh, myself. So I think, you know, it is uh, good to, um, you know, for us to serve as a role modeling, inspiring, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a senior mentors uh, whenever there is an opportunity. And I think that um, uh, could uh, make a di big difference. But, you know, general kind of a message for me briefly is, you know, um, think hard, work hard, and, you know, leave your inhibitions behind. Because I think that comes back to, you know, confidence as well. Sometimes it's just that we can do it, but it's just the level of confidence that, you know, we, we grew up with. I think that's just, you know, something to keep in mind. And be fearless about, um, you know, what you want to pursue. Okay. Professor Maria Laura, can you leave the final message? Yeah, I already talked a lot, so <laughs> you know me, but I want, yes, very brief. Yes, I want to move on, a, on the same part of Krista, and I want to encourage all the uh, young female medicinal chemists, let's try. It's tough, you have to work very hard but it's really worth it. I'm so happy of my career. And uh, I believe that as a scientist, as a medicinal chemist, we have such a rewarding life. Uh, and so this is uh, truly an encouragement to all of you to be motivated to enter and stay in the field because it's a fantastic life. Thank you, Professor. And now, Dr. Maudreta, can you leave a final comment, please? I think also what I wanted to say is not to be shy to reach out. So if you meet someone in a conference who's on a senior level who you find inspiring, reach out to them, contact them, because I think we, at senior level, you often have gone through struggles yourself. So you're, you're more inclined to actually uh, want to help out others. So please don't be shy to reach out. Thank you. Sharon, can you comment also? I'm muted. Hello. <laughs> yes. So um, I would underscore everything that's been said here um, already today. Um, but I think also just building your confidence um, and staying strong and persevering. I mean, I think I mentioned earlier, I didn't have uh, female direct mentors, but there were three women uh, who strongly influenced me and inspired me to continue in science. One was Gertruda Elion, uh, who won the Nobel Prize um, in um, 1988. I met her in 1994 at NIEHS when Marty Rodbell won the Nobel Prize. This was a stroke of luck uh, for me, but it was very inspiring um, to meet her. The second, maybe a person, I'm not sure if you know her, um, Jane Richardson from Duke University, um, who developed this kind of protein rendering. She was a star at the protein conferences. There was mostly all men. And I went to this conference and uh, she, I found her amazing. Uh, and I invited her as a very young scientist. I think I was just 30 years old to NIEHS to give a lecture for the Distinguished Science Lecture Series. Um, and uh, I was just so thrilled and so nervous <laughs> to meet her at that time. But she really inspired me and showed me that. And she has all of, both of those women have very, um, let's say, untraditional career paths. So you can read about them. And the third one you may know, because she's active um, in chemistry, which is retired now. And that's Yvonne Martin, who um, was at ABV for her career, a computational chemist, a chemist uh, by training, uh, but built her career in computational chemistry and was one of the medicinal chemistry division um, 
leaders, uh, Maria Laura at ACS. So one of those five, I think you mentioned, uh, she was one of them and she was also very present and influenced me and really showed me that it's possible um, to build a career there. So look for those mentors and be inspired, um, or not mentors, but role models and be inspired. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck and I look forward to um, the future and seeing what all uh, you guys uh, uh, inspire to do. Thank you. Now we will close this round table with Professor Humuraira. This is a not gender balanced <laughs> round table, but uh, a last comment, Professor Rui. I think basically all the important things have been said, but I, I would like to, stri to stress that uh, it is important for you to find role models. I think that's the, the first step. They will guide you and all uh, across your life and it's important for you and uh, don't be afraid to make questions uh, uh, to try to find advices i think that's very important and to be active when you also find injustice i think that's uh, try to be vocal in those cases because that's also very important and when possible if you find something that can be changed try to be positive and make suggestions that's i mean institutions now are really open to change and you can and have an active role in, in, in making those changes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to all the speakers.